Well, good morning. Welcome to another episode of Bushcraft Survival. Last night, I drove the troopy in to an, one of my favorite areas. I parked the troopy. I cammed the troopy up. And the reason why I do that is because some of my favorite areas are like coming. I don't really want others to know that it's a camping area because what happens lots and lots is that uh, when people see an area that's used, they want to use it too and there's nothing wrong with that about sharing our areas but unfortunately people um, don't always pay the area the same respect I do and that others do and they end up trashing the whole area. So one reason I do that is just so other people don't see that that, that area is there so that they don't think to camp because there's a thing I like to call the sheep mentality. People tend to just do what everyone else, want, everyone else does rather than their own thing and that tends to uh, turn an area that is nice into an area that's not so nice because they leave rubbish and all the, all the other things that go with that. So that's one reason I do that. I'm not going to be in the army, which I am. It's not for the reason of um, any sort of clandestine thing at all. It's purely just to sort of maintain the sort of, um, say, secrecy and privacy of an area so that other people don't come in and trash it. That's all that is. Um, so having said that, I cammed up the cam the troopy, came into my area, and I set up camp for the night. I got here just before dark, a little bit before dark. I like to get here a little bit earlier. It's going to put some air into this fire. So I came in last night. Uh, parked the troopy, cammed the troopy, and I just set up, set up a quick camp last night, which considered, consists on a, of a hammock and tarp, and um, uh, there yeah, got myself off the ground. I actually prefer sleeping on the ground, but occasionally I set up the, um, the, uh, the, the hammock. And in a cold environment, I prefer, I feel warmer on the ground, but as I said, it's horses for courses. We'll have a look at what, what our setup is very soon. And so, yeah, got the fire going, uh, got some water on the boil, had a cup of tea and some dinner. And this morning, this morning I got up, it was actually pretty cold. I got down to about uh, eight or nine degrees last night. And it was got, got pretty cool. There was still enough embers in the fire to get the fire going this morning. Got some water on um, for the boil and had a cup of tea. And now I'm just enjoying a bit of breakfast. And uh, just getting ready for uh, what we're going to do today. And we've got a very... Uh, special day today because David, my cameraman, is actually coming to um, join me for the day. I'm just waiting for him to arrive. He should be here shortly. And we're going to um, film a whole stack of different things today. We're going to be looking at, so actually we're going to, the main thing this afternoon is we're going to shoot a, an episode on, um, we're going to actually get a leg of lamb and we're going to roast it in, in the ground oven, as well as getting a lot of um, local ve foraged vegetables and, and, and vegetable type foods. Um, as well as some stuff from the supermarket and cook them all collectively in a ground oven. And while we're waiting for that to cook, we're going to do a whole stack of other things. We don't know what it's going to be yet, we're just going to make it up as it goes. We're going to have lots of tips and, and bushcraft things. We're just going to let the, the day progress nat naturally and we're going to stay overnight as well. So it's going to be a whole stack of things unplanned and it should be a lot of fun. So um, stick around and hope you enjoy the day. So just to give you a look at the setup that I used last night, um, as you know, I, I don't mind sleeping in a hammock. I just prefer to sleep on the ground, but that's just, it's all personal choice. I find I just get a better um, night's sleep. But there are occasions when I, you know, do prefer to sleep in a hammock and up when I'm, I'm you know, doing military things in, in North Force with the army and with up there or I'm um, out camping, I generally prefer to use a hammock up in those environments because it's a bit warmer, but in cold environments, I usually prefer to be on the ground. However, last night I chose, I decided to give a little bit of a kit a try out. And um, hammocks are great. It is nice and quick when you can get two trees in the right area. So as always, I set up my shelter first, and this is a Helicon Text, uh, which a new, new shelter I'm trying out. 
It's uh, the Helicon Tech's all-weather shelter or super shelter. Good bit of kit actually. It's got, it's it's a lot. It's a bit bigger than the standard army hutchie, which is what I was after. So this is quite um, a really good piece of kit. And uh, my hammock is a Alton Goods hammock, and I use that all the time. It's a really good hammock, and it all comes as a complete kit. And the usual snug pack Kestrel sleeping bag. Uh, softy six and underneath now I've actually got from a different brand remember I just use stuff that that I like that works there's I've got no affiliation with any of these things uh, I've just got a, a, a cocoon an underground lightweight cocoon which is actually from Hennessy hammocks but it doesn't have all the inf uh, the uh, inside paraphernalia the uh, the uh, thick blankets and the um, all the stuff that comes with winter hammock camping. I find that stuff just overly bulky and for a hike in it's just way too bulky. So I think of something that I can have the option of sleeping on the ground with or sleeping in a hammock. So what I do in that case, I've just got this very light outer, I've actually forget what it's called, uh, it's from H Hennessy Hammocks and this just crunches up really small, nice and easy. And underneath that I've got my blow up snug pack three-quarter therm arrest mattress really great piece of kit it's only three quarters it's all you need for the ground and I've half inflated it and I've just stuck it under there I could have stuck it inside the hammock that works too and in fact that's what I normally do you don't really need a lot of that other stuff you can just have a blow-up mattress and that's just half inflate it and you've done the same thing it's that having that air pocket underneath you in a hammock because otherwise you get cold patches and you and you get those due to um, convection that wet wind chill so you need to have an air pocket under you especially as cold as it's been so I've just got this tried this out and that that works really well for me and that's with the with the sleep in the blow up sleeping mat within that and I was toasty warm all night and I've also got the option of sleeping on the ground rather than having to take two massive separate lots of kits to do either or so to me you want to want to go as light as possible so that gives me two options and I had a really really comfy night's sleep no problems at all and that's a good that's a that's a good system the uh, light and these are great this is the um, lead lenser ml4 the, the, the new their new little um, torch and this is these are really great pieces of kit variety of settings on them from red you know bright and you can take and they last for hours I think it's about 35 hours on the low setting some of these things things last and they're really fantastic pieces pieces of kit you USB chargeable really work really well they take up no room at all um, and yeah very um, hang them anywhere with those little clips great for reading and you, you don't even know you've got them on you but it's USB chargeable that's what I like so that's the uh, lead lenser M L4 and great piece of kit to have and with that I'll set for the night so um, and of course I've got a ground sheet down here and that's just because anyone that sleep in a sleeping bag knows what it's like to get in a hammock in a hammock I usually prefer to have a blanket rather than a sleeping bag so that's it's um that's always a chore getting in and out so that's what that ground sheet is down there for but other than that just my very basic kit my 10 piece kit which is always with me and uh, that was my setup for the night. Last night when I arrived, you would have seen that the first thing I did was to collect some firewood, prepare the fire area and, and get a fire going. I also went and collected some water so I could get some water on the boil first thing. And what I used to collect that water, or at least filter the water, coarse filter the water, was a Millbank bag and this is what the army have used for years and years this is what we still use in the army however they are phasing them out sadly why I don't know because they're a great simple piece of kit they're made of a very fine canvas weave very specific canvas weave and it course filters the water it just gets the sediment the particulate matter and the turbidity out of the water and then it makes it clear so then you can use other purif purification methods be it through boiling which what we've used or um, man-made chemical you know chlorine chlorine dioxide iodine all those other uh, man-made um, chemicals to um, treat your water but the first stage is always coarse filtering and that's what we've used here now because the army's phasing these out in other um, countries they've actually got rid of them all together and they're pretty hard to get so a chap by the name of Rupert Brown in the UK 
has developed his own version of this using the specs of the material that we used in World War II. And it's called the brown ba bag and uh, aptly named and it's a great piece of kit. So it's exactly the same thing. And it's um, actually, it's a, it's a slower filtering, which means it's, 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 it's a more thorough filter because even with the military ones, some are okay, some aren't so okay because some of them just the run through and some of the copies of them, the run through is way, way too fast. So it's not actually filtering to the, the amount that it should. These are excellent and the drip rate is a lot slower which means it's actually filtering it um, properly. So uh, Rupert Brown, there's a, there's a few different sizes you can get from these but they're actually a really great piece of kit and we use, we use those and the Millbank bags on our courses all the time and they're a great, really great piece of kit. When you finish using them they fold up to nothing and go inside your pack and you've got a water filter. I've even heard the people making a herbal tea inside of them. We might have to give that another shot. Some, give that a shot sometime. So we've collected our water, filtered it, put it onto boil, and what we have is some water that I've allowed to cool overnight. And now what I'm going to do is transfer this into my MSR dromedary bag. Now these bags are. A, great piece of kit. So again, fold up to nothing, it's all about being lightweight. Excellent pieces of kit. Now they come in various sizes um, from I think 2, 4, 6 and 10 and th there's a different ways of holding them but they're great and they're great. Once you've got cool water you can actually um, hang them up and then you've got a tap system they come. There's a variety of different tap systems you can use and then you can just hang them up and you get cool water as you need for a drink and that's what we're going to do. It's best, you, they can take warm water but I prefer to let it cool. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to take the lid off that, put it in my pocket so it doesn't get dirty. Just going to fill this up. make sure that's depressed so we don't <laughs> that water doesn't splash out again once it gets enough water from weight there that'll be fine and I'm just going to tip that in and you put as much water in as you need I've just got some more water on the boil there, so I'll transfer that or get this on the boil and put some more water in that shortly. Lid goes on. Get a good seal. And I can hang that up. The other great thing about this is it's I can actually carry, I mean it's not that's not full enough yet, but I've got different ways of carrying it. I can actually um, carry it like that and it actually is great to put water out. There's a few different configurations you can um, carry this. But for now I'm just going to hang this egg. Very durable and depending you've got to find where that wants to sit naturally which is it looks like that wants to sit there and there's a little flipping lid there. Now make sure you've got clean hands so in a group situation I have a tap and I prefer the tap situation rather than putting your fingers there. So make sure your fingers are clean doing that. And there you go and you can fill up your cup that way. We'll turn that off. There's also showers and all sorts of things you can adjust, get to attach that so you can have a shower and everything in one with these things. Really are great pieces of kit. And once they're empty, they fold up to nothing and go straight back into your, into your pack. Couldn't be any simpler than that. So that's the MSR 6 litre dromedary bag.
We're going to go shopping now to collect some food for our meal that we're going to cook in our ground oven this afternoon. But before we go shopping, I need to make a tool that is going to enable me to dig some of those foods up. In fact, it's a tool that indigenous cultures all over the world have used, and that tool is a digging stick. Really important tool, very, very versatile. So in order to do that, I've, I've cut down an, a good size piece of, of wood. It uh, wasn't good, it's just been freshly dyed. We had bushfires down, so it's got a bit of weight in it and I can feel that, so that's actually going to be nice and durable. And I'm going to use my Granfers of Sweden small forest axe to actually put a point on this because I'm aim aiming to make one end like a chisel and the other end like a point, so it gives me a, a variety of uh, things I can do with it. I'm going to take the mask off, that's what we call our mask or our sheath, and I'm going to put that in my pocket so that it doesn't get lost. Now, in bushcraft, I said an axe is a very dangerous tool, and a lot of people don't know how to use an axe. A lot of the courses in, in the UK, you're not allowed to use an axe until you've done a course, because out of all the tools we use, this is the most dangerous because the injury and injuries an, an axe will inflict are far more serious than a knife. So with that comes proper usage um, and correct use. And I've seen a lot of videos, a lot of YouTube videos, people just are using the axe in the incorrect way completely. Very, very dangerous. And if you're out bush doing solo camping trips and things like that, if you get an injury from an axe, it's going to be a devastating in injury. So you need to make sure you're using it safely. Very, very important. So I'm, I'm kneeling down and we're going to have a look later on this afternoon at, at splitting some wood. But in this sort of thing, I want to think, where is this axe going to go if I was to miss? Is it going to go into the, the wood or is it going to go into me? So that's why I'm kneeling down so that I've got a nice wooden uh, bench here and I don't want that going anywhere near my body. Very, very important. Safety comes first when using an axe. And I'm looking at putting a point on here and getting a good grip. I've just fashioned that into a, a, a blunt chisel. I'm going to sharpen that up with my knife. So that's one end, so I've got a nice flat chisel end, and I'm going to turn this end into a point. Now I'm just going to tidy up these a little bit with my knife, and uh, which is a Maracniv Garberg, and I'm just going to tidy that up a bit. Now notice that I'm cutting to the outside of the body. A lot of people when they sit down cut in here. Now remember this being the triangle of death. You cut yourself from the fem femoral artery and it doesn't matter if there's an ambulance right there, the chances are you'll die from that. So you need to stay away, that's why when we stand up we always cut to the outside of the body and a general rule of thumb which I learned from one of Paul Kirtley's courses in the UK, fantastic courses, and that is that when you're using a knife, when you're sitting down, you must always place your elbows on your knees. Then there is no way that you can cut into that area. And that's great for kids. If kids are using a knife, you're teaching that just takes away that danger straight away. So any form of sitting down when you're, when you're cutting with a knife, elbows on knees, and, there, and you can't uh, get into any trouble with cutting yourself.
there's our uh, flattened chisel end. Now, if that was green wood, which is, I really need to fire harden that. We might stick that in the fire and we'll show how you fire harden that to make that more resilient. But just for a one-off use, if you're using that, you wouldn't have to do that. The other end, I'm just going to tidy up that on a nice point. I don't want the point too sharp. If the point's too sharp, it's just going to break off. Now, all over Australia, the digging stick was and is one of the most useful tools that um, our Indigenous Australians had used. And indeed, all over the world, Indigenous cultures have had digging sticks. Okay, that's looking pretty good. It's a nice, usable digging stick. We just have to... Uh, just going to quickly fire harden a, a section of this to make it more durable, more resilient, and then we're ready to go shopping. So in order to make this tool more durable so it's going to last, what I need to do, because it's um, a little bit green, as I said, it's just recently dyed this one, um, I need to fire harden the end. And all I need to do is just using a fire, I'm actually going to push this into the ashes of the fire. I don't want to stick it on top. I don't want it to burn. That's just going to cause the wood to split. Because um, what we're doing is trying to um, get rid of the moisture out of it without letting it crack. That's the key point. So in order to do that, we have to exclude the oxygen. And where there's no oxygen is inside the coals underneath. So that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to take that tip, shove it into the coal, into the underneath the earth, and I'm just going to rotate that gently for about 20, 30 seconds. So I've done that a few times. Put it into the, uh, into the ashes, excluding the oxygen, for about 20, 30 seconds rotating, and that's hot to the touch. Just so I can hold it and then have to let go, then that's a sign and then I re-put that back in a number of times that's six or seven times and I'm just slowly driving that moisture out and I'm going to do that with both ends it's getting nice and hot there that's good and what I'm doing is drying that out and what I want to, and I'll keep doing that until we've got a nice, um, hard, durable tip. And that's the same way that you'd make an arrow as well, fire hardening the end of those arrows, making them very, very, very strong. Because what happens? Just split if it's green. And um, but so this is a great way of expend, uh, expelling that moisture out without without the wood cracking. It makes it very, very strong and hard, particularly for its use. It's going to get today.
this beautiful little creek line running through here and that's where we've been getting our water water from. But last night I've noticed a, a few yabbies in there. So what I thought we'd do is I've had a trap with me, put a little bit of salami, a little bit of meat inside that trap and we're going to have a look at what we've got. Got one little yabby in there. No guppies. I'm just going to take him and put him in a, in a bit of water here. We'll see what's in there. We might probably end up letting these fellas go. He's only small, but we'll just see how many of these fellas we can get. There you go. Just shorten that. There he is. Okay, there's a few, I've got a second net in here, so I've just um, popped in. We've got this little fella as well. So I'm gonna see how many we get. We can always just um, release them because I've got a, some, some water in there. They're fine, they're, they're fine in that way. But we'll just see what we can get. There's quite a few here. There's actually some guppy fish as well. And it's interesting because this area has actually been dry for a couple of years, so it's a lot of water. So they're just, it's great to see them back. We'll put him there just for now. So earlier we collected the five-leaved native grape, or Cissus hypoglorca, and this is um, a great, um, a, it has an edible uh, red grape, which is, um, it actually doesn't come out until about October this year, but uh, it's also known as a water vine, as we get them up in Darwin as well. Actually, there's a few of the Cissus species you can, the, um, the grape vines, and what we've done We've, in order to, to know, we've cut, I, uh, with my axe, I left my machete at home, so I had to use my axe, but I was very careful in how cutting away from my body. Generally, you don't use an axe above your head. But um, that's all I had, but I was very careful the way I used it. Usually, you'd use a machete for this sort of um, thing. And I've cut it low, then high, and through capillary action, you hold that up and the water drips down, and that's what's happening here. Now, for water from a vine to be able to be drunk, it needs to be um, not milky, not have a milky sap, it needs to be clear and it needs to be odourless and they're the three criteria. If it doesn't have those three then it's no good and this satisfies all of those. It's clear, it's odourless and it tastes pretty good actually. It's, um, it's just cleared. However we want to consume this because it comes from a plant source within say 24 hours. So I've been very careful to cut the ends off at 45 degrees because then that allows that to drip out. Now we could make this a little bit steeper and that would run faster but that's about as steep as we got, but we're going to get here without them sliding off. But we could put them more vertical and that's going to run out faster. This will slow down and as the hole closes up and then we just simply have to re-chop them again. There should be enough within here to at least half fill this container. So we might have to come back and cut them and get that to drop. But very important, great way of getting water. Um, you can get quite a lot of water from these, but of course doing so is going to kill the rest of the vine. So be selective where we took these from. There were loads and loads of them, and this is all from the one, the one branch. Um, so once again, just make sure it's the, the water needs to be clear, odourless, and not have milky sap. And that's a good way to get a drink out in the bush.
This is a one-man debris hut I built a couple of months ago and this will be upstanding for probably a couple of years. We teach, to, teach people how to make these on our courses. Very simple shelter to build, literally a framework of straight sticks, tripod at the front and I've just made a rake and I've just raked up a lot of leaves and stacked them from the bottom up about this thick and that's created a very very nice uh, waterproofing watershed and it's completely dry in there it's still dry now afterwards and we have had a lot of rain a real lot of rain it's actually marvelous and I've spent a couple of nights in that and it's really good this will be upstanding for quite a while you can make two-man shelters all different sizes but it's very simple to make especially when you have a lot of uh, debris around such as we have here so that's a, what we call a debris hut well we've been out foraging all afternoon for some wild edibles and we've got a nice collection of things we're going to cook up tonight but at the same time we're going to make a ground oven in front of here, and what better place to have it than in front of this a traditional shelter, we're going to have a ground oven dug in the ground and we're actually going to cook some root vegetables and a leg of lamb. And that's going to be absolutely brilliant. So we're going to prepare this area now to make a ground oven. We have to do a few things first. We have to collect some firewood. We have to collect some rocks because we're going to actually use the hot rocks to cook that in. So we're going to have to collect some paper bark and we're actually going to make a beautiful in-ground paper bark oven to do that. And while we're waiting for that to cook, we're going to have a beautiful bush snack of some of the forage foods we collected this afternoon. So we've dug our hole, we've collected our rocks, we've collected firewood, we've lit a fire and we've put all our rocks on our fire so that we can heat them up red hot. And what we're going to do, we're going to put them inside our hole, which we've actually pre-lit with a fire to warm it up and warm the, warm the hole up. We're going to put our rocks inside this hole, then we're going to cover it with um, some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, cabbage tree palm leaves. Then on top of that, we're going to stick our meat. We've got some lamb here, potatoes, carrots, sweet potatoes. And today you saw us collect 
the uh, cabbage tree palm, Liverstoner australis, which we um, collected. Now, the early settlers used to eat this all the time because the middle section in here is beautiful. It's like if you've ever had heart of palm, it's exactly what this is like. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful vegetable. However, you need to be careful because these were over harvested. We're on private land and that's why we have permission to do this where we are. And there are, there's hundreds of them here, but you need to be very, very careful on that because if you take, when you take the growing heart of this plant, it kills a tree. I specifically selected a very small one amongst many, there are hundreds of them around here. So very, very um, carefully what I selected. And I've done this just so we can demonstrate how it works. But very, very, in fact, all the Liverstoner species in the world are edible, the growing tip. So as we talk about the growing, growing terminal bud, which we've taken out of that tree, and um, we're gonna cook that up on the fire. The other parts of it, the leaves are great for shelter building, the dead ones. You can wrap things, you can make cordage out of the, uh, the, the, the ribs and the leaves. The tinder in, inside it, the actual, uh, around the, uh, the casing here, this fibrous material is excellent for fire lighting. We've used that many, many times, that's excellent. And it's a food source, cordage, fire, food and shelter, there's four uses. So this makes this a supermarket plant, absolutely amazing. So what we're going to do, we're going to cook this up like a root vegetable amongst all of these other things. Now these could be, these sort of signify lots of other things you could get in the wild or that type of thing. And we're gonna cook some more, uh, some of the other things that we forage today. We're gonna to cook those up on the fire here as well in a different way. So this could be a, a leg of kangaroo. It could be, it could be anything and we've got root vegetables. And what we're gonna do is cook them in this ground oven on top of the hot rocks, which we're gonna put in the fire. We're gonna wait an hour and a half to two hours. We're gonna seal it over and then wait for that, that designated time for it to cook. The longer you wait, the better, because we want it to cook very, very slowly. And it'll be really worth it in the end. And Dave, the, um, who's filming this, is gonna uh, be is salivating at the thought, because he's hungry, <laughs> and as I am. Because it gets it because it's winter, it's getting dark pretty early. So we've actually um, it's yeah, it takes a bit of time. But out in the bush when we're doing these things, it takes as long as it takes. And so we're going to get this in now. I'm going to all of these boards. So we're going to stick them in the fire, put down the the rocks, the hot rocks. Well, I may or may not put one of those on top. We're going to lay our meat and our vegetables on top, and then this row of. Um, green timber you can see is going to go over the top. I've got a paper bark sheet over the top of that. I'll put another two of those and then we're going to seal this with dirt. We're going to make a very, very hot oven and that's going to seal it 100% inside there. And um, we're going to wait an hour and a half to two hours for that to cook. And that should be absolutely fantastic at that. It's slow cooking is the best way to do this. And then we're going to have a, a bush snack from our forage edibles that we got today in the meantime. So we'll crack on. While we're waiting for our um, food to cook in our ground oven, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna cook up and make a quick snack, a forager's snack of the food that we collected today. But just before we do, I'm just gonna give you a quick soldier's five on what those foods were. We collected some native ginger, or Alpinia carulia, and alternate leaves, which is a, a nice, um, which is not a poison um, indicator. Opposite leaves are the poison indicator, or one of the nine, but these are alternate. 
So that's a, a, a good sign with that. And this is native ginger. And we're going to cook it up like a regular ginger. It's not as strong as the ginger buy in the shops, but it's still, nevertheless, a great, it makes a great um, ginger, ginger substitute. And we're going to add that to, to our dish tonight. Our next one is spiny headed mat rush or Lamandra longifolia. We've looked at this quite a few times and this grows everywhere around in the eastern states of Australia. It's, uh, it's used in um, landscaping. It is a wonderful, uh, a wonderful plant. It's strap-like leaves are great for, for, for basket making. It, it's, uh, the dried ones are great for fire. We've looked at that for making uh, uh, tinder, the dead ones that is, and anything that's used for uh, uh, cordage is automatically great for fire lighting. But our interest is in these white stems and we're going to be cutting those up and, and frying them up with our other ingredients and that's going to make a great bush snack. They're edible like they are but we're going to be putting those in there as well. So that's Lamandra longifolia or spiny headed mat rush. We also collected some native parsnip or trachymene incisor is its botanical name and that's because the leaves leaves look as part of the carrot family and because the leaves actually look like uh, teeth incisors and that's where it gets its name so occasionally the uh, the botanists do the right thing by everyone and they call something with a name that, that it looks uh, that, that it looks like and uh, very easy to dig up and get a lot of these in the one go. And we're gonna cook those up just like a parsnip and we're gonna fry them all up together, um, cut them up, and that's gonna be add to our, you know, give us a great vegetable content to what we're going to uh, eat tonight. So that's uh, native parsnip or trachamine incisor. Our next one is one of my favorites. And this plant grows all up in northern Australia. This is the uh, native long yam, also known as pencil yam or Discoria transversa. And it's a bit of an act to finding this plant. When you look for this plant, you need to a, identify the leaves, which is much harder when it's um, when they're dead. But then we have, there's a seed pot, they, the, the seed pods weren't about today and the area we are was hit by bushfire last year so all of that stuff's been destroyed. But they have a very um, like an elongated heart shaped leaf, and there's a smaller one. And they're a bit bigger in the Northern Territory. And what you need to do is once you identify these, all the, the uh, sort of tri-lobed uh, seed pods, they're like winged, like a tri-winged seed pod is find this long, uh, vi it's a vine, find that and you need to trace that down until you actually find where it goes and from that point you dig it out and it's quite a, it can, can be a laborious task and they can be go anywhere from you know a few inches down to almost half a metre depending on where you are particularly up north. Harder to find them now up north because all the uh, the pigs that were introduced a couple of hundred years ago have just they just destroyed and they eat everything out on all our army survival courses in North Force. Lots of sign that they're there, but if you can get them before the pigs, that's a bit of a it's a bit of a hard thing to do these days. And what they have, and you can see why they get their name pencil yam. That was our lot. We've got a couple there, all growing from the from the same bud. Or we're going to, that's, that's actually edible like that as it is. Very soft, soft. Bit of a parsnip taste. It's a little bit sweet. It's actually great. Very soft, very juicy. Hmm. I the rest of that. We're going to cut those up and stick those in there. Hmm. That's a really good fresh one. We only got the one of those. If we had more time, we would have collected a whole stack more. So that's Discoria transversa or the native long yam. There is a poisonous cousin for that up north, which is known as a cheeky yam, but that doesn't grow down here in New South Wales. And that can be found all along the East, um, New South Wales coast um, from mid north coast right up to Queensland. Great bush tucker that one. 
and it's not a bush tucker well it is actually they're not in season at the moment I found some uh, sandpaper fig or ficus coronata now sandpaper fig because the leaves of this are just like sandpaper so you can you know they're great for sanding sanding things work great job and actually Aboriginal people used to sand their hand drills with this and still do I've done it a few times <coughs> or if you're that way inclined you can do your nails as well you can hear that and it's um, works great as sandpaper yeah fantastic stuff the figs on this are a black fruit when they're ripe and they're, they're edible they're absolutely beautiful but they're not in season at the moment all figs are edible the contrapoison indicator with this is that all figs have a white sap uh, that white latex sap which is a poison indicator on all plants however most figs this is the exception to the rule so for all the poison universal poison indicators out there there are many exceptions to the rule this is one of them white sap with this particular one that's okay white sap on the uh, uh, native grapevine that we we're getting water from today that would be a poison indicator you wouldn't even touch that if it had a white milky sap so there are exceptions but if in doubt leave out make sure you know your plant before you harvest it and I hasten to add with all of these plants you'll notice that when I've collected them I've left the full leaf, all the leaves on them and the root so whenever you collect particularly correct I'll say again whenever you when you collect the roots you must make sure that you leave the leaves on them for identification purposes and therefore you can positively identify that plant because you might get that mixed up with something else so that's really really important with any of these native plants make sure you a have a hundred percent identification and make sure that when you get that plant out you've got the entire leaf and you've got the roots so you can identify it positively because it's very easy to uh, mix things up and when it comes to mushrooms and things like that you get that wrong that can be a death sentence however with this stuff we're we're pretty right so a hundred percent positive identification is paramount so what we're going to do now i'm going to get this ingredients and we're going to add to our dish a carrot and an onion and just a couple of um ingredients from home to fry these up as a quick snack while we're waiting for our ground oven. just a little bit crunchy I mean that's nice that's the way I like it okay it's been two and a half hours we've given a bit of extra time before we open our ground oven in that time we've cooked up our wild edibles and we had a bit of a feast and they were pretty nice I must say nice snack just to carry us over and when you're cooking in the bush it's you can't really put a time on it it's done when it's done and we're hoping this is going to be done so what we're going to do we're going to do exactly what we did in reverse take the uh, take the dirt off and gently peel that back and we're going to put our food down here 
and we're going to get stuck into um, the spoils of this uh, ground oven. Finally. Finally. We get to eat. It's been a long one, hasn't it's it? Been a very long, it's been a long day. <laughs> it's been a very long day. But it um, it's worth it. And this looks incredible. Oh. Now, before any of you start digging into Gordon, I bought these chairs. <laughs> For a little bit of comfort, and I, I tried to wine. talk you out of it though, didn't I? Well, you absolutely did. <laughs> and I bought the wine as well. Oh, David, that's fantastic. Oh, cheers. Oh, cheers. cup's over there cheers next cup. to you. Oh, there you go. Where's your cup? Yours. It's not quite bushcraft. <laughs> but exception for this video. Exception for this one. <laughs> there we go. Oh, what have we got here? Some Jacob's Creek. Shiraz. Cheers, mate. Cheers, David. Cheers. Thanks for being patient. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>